History bends to the will of man when it is exercised with faith and steadfastness. Umar was one such man. He bent history to his will, leaving a legacy that successor generations have looked upon as a model to copy. He was one of the greatest conquerors, a wise administrator, a just ruler, a monumental builder and a man of piety who loved Allah with the same intensity that the conquerors of his caliber have loved gold and wealth. The Prophet planted the seed of Tawheed at its most elemental level. Tawheed means believe in one God. In its historical sense, it connotes a God-focused civilization where all human effort is directed towards seeking divine pleasure. Abu Bakr an, with his wise intercession at an historic moment ensured that the seed did not perish with the death of the Prophet. It was during the Caliphate of Umar an, that the seed grew into a full-blown tree and bore fruit. Umar an, shaped the historical edifice of Islam and whatever Islam became or did not become in subsequent centuries is due primarily to the work of this historical figure. Indeed, Umar was the architect of Islamic civilization. His full name is Umar ibn al-Khattab ibn Nufail ibn Abdul Uzza. He was known as Abu Hafs. He was born in 583 AC, 13 years after Amul Fil, the year of the elephant. He was muscular, tall, solid. When he walked, he walked quickly. When he spoke, he spoke clearly. And when he struck, he caused pain. Umar spent half of his life in the pre-Islamic society and grew up like his peers of Quraysh, except that he has an advantage over them in that he was one of those who had learned to read, to whom there were very few. He bore responsibility at an early age and had a very harsh upbringing in which he knew no type of luxury or manifestation of wealth. His father, Al-Khattab, forced him to tend his camels. His father's harsh treatment had a negative effect on Umar, which he remembered all his life. From his early youth, he also excelled in many kinds of sports, such as wrestling, riding, and horsemanship. He enjoyed and narrated poetry. He was interested in the history and affairs of his people. He was keen to attend the great fairs of the Arabs, such as Ukaz, Mijanna, and Du al Majaz, where he would make the most of the opportunity to engage in trade and learning the history of the Arabs and the battles and contests that had taken place among the tribes. Besides, he engaged in trade and profited, which made him one of the rich men of Mecca. He became acquainted with many people in the countries that he visited for the purpose of trade. He traveled to Syria in the summer and Yemen in the winter. Thus, he occupied a prominent position in Mecca society during the pre-Islamic era. Umar was wise, eloquent, well-spoken, strong, tolerant, noble, persuasive, and clear of speech, which made him qualified to be an ambassador for Quraysh to speak up for them before the other tribes. Ibn al Jawzi said, The role of ambassador fell to Umar ibn al Khattab. If there was a war between Quraysh and another tribe, they would send him as an ambassador. And if another tribe was boasting against them, they would send him 
to respond in kind, and they were pleased with him. When Islam came to the Arabian Peninsula, there were few converts at first. Many people resisted the message, and Umar radiallahu an, was a most bitter opponent. When a small group of Muslims migrated to Abyssinia, Umar radiallahu an became worried about the future unity of the Quraysh and decided to have Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam assassinated. On this, he met his best friend Nuaym bin Abdullah radiallahu an, who had secretly converted to Islam but had not told Umar. He told Umar radiallahu an to inquire about his own house where his sister and her husband had converted to Islam. Upon arriving at her house, Umar found his sister and brother-in-law Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu an reciting the verses from the Quran from Surah Taha. He started quarreling with his brother-in-law. When his sister came to rescue her husband, he also started quarreling with her. Yet still they kept on saying, You may slay us, but we will not give up Islam. Upon hearing these words, Umar slapped his sister so hard that she fell to the ground, bleeding from her mouth. When he saw what he did to his sister, he calmed down out of guilt and asked his sister to give him what she was reciting. His sister replied in the negative and said, You are unclean and no unclean person can touch the scripture. The first ray of the light of faith that touched his heart came on when he saw the women of Quraysh leaving their homeland and traveling to a distant land because of the persecution that they were facing from Umar radiallahu an and other unbelievers. His conscience was moved and he felt remorse and pity for them. And he spoke kind words to them, which they had never expected to hear from this person beforehand. Um Abdullah bin Hantam said, When we were migrating to Abyssinia, Umar, who used to persecute us mercilessly, came and stood over and said to me, Are you leaving? I said, Yes, for you have persecuted us and oppressed us. And by Allah, we are going out in the land of Allah until Allah grants us a way out. Then Umar said, May Allah be with you. And I saw kindness that I had never seen before. Umar was moved by this woman's attitude and he felt distressed. How much suffering the followers of this new religion were putting up with. But despite that, they were standing firm. What was the secret beyond this extraordinary strength? He felt sad and his heart was filled with pain. Shortly, after this incident, Umar radiallahu an became Muslim as a result of the prayers of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which was the main reason for his acceptance of Islam. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had prayed for him, saying, "O oh Allah, honor Islam through Abu Jahl bin Hisham or through Umar bin al-Khattab." Umar radiallahu an came the next day to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and accepted Islam. Umar became Muslim in 616 AD, one year after the migration to Abyssinia, when he was 27 years old. He accepted Islam three days after Hamza radiallahu an, the Prophet's uncle. At that time, the Muslims numbered 39. Umar radiallahu an said. I remember that when I became Muslim, there were just 39 men with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and I brought the number to 40. Thus Allah caused His religion to prevail and grant glory to Islam. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an said, We felt a sense of pride when Umar became Muslim, for we could not circumambulate the holy mosque and pray until Umar became Muslim. Umar's becoming a Muslim was a victory. His migration was help and his caliphate was a mercy. We could not pray or circumambulate the house until Umar became Muslim. When he became Muslim, he fought the unbelievers until they left us alone and let us pray. 
Ali bin Abi Talib said to me, I do not know of any of the migrants who did not migrate in secret, except Umar ibn al-Khattab. When he decided to migrate, he put on his sword, put his bow over his shoulder, picked up his arrows and carried his stick. He went out to the Kaaba, where a number of Quraysh were gathered in its courtyard and circumambulated the house seven times at a leisurely pace. Then he went to the maqam and prayed tranquilly. Then he went to the circles of people one by one and said to them, whoever wants his mother to be bereft of him and his children to become orphans and his wife to become a widow, let him meet me behind this valley. Ali said, no one followed him except a few of those who were weak and oppressed. He taught them and told them about Islam. Then he went on his way. Umar ibn al-Khattab reported, I entered the room of the Messenger of Allah while he was lying on his side over a mat. I sat down as he drew up his lower garment and he was not wearing anything else. The mat had left marks on his side. I looked at the Prophet's cupboard and I saw a handful of barley in a small amount, the same of mimosa leaves in the corner and a leather bag hanging to the side. My eyes started to tear up, and the Prophet said, What makes you weep, O son of Khattab? I said, O Prophet of Allah, why should I not cry that this mat has left marks on your side, and I see little in this cupboard? Caesar and Khusra live among fruits and springs, while you are the Messenger of Allah and His Chosen, yet this is your cupboard? The Prophet said, O son of Khattab, are you not pleased that they are for us in the hereafter and for them in the world? I said, of course. When the Prophet died, Umar was in denial and refused to believe that he died. Who says that the Prophet is dead? I testify that he is alive and has gone to Allah like Moses and would return to us after some time. Umar promised to strike the head of any man who would say that he died. The door of the chamber of Aisha opened and a thin, frail old man moved towards the courtyard of the mosque. He had the look of a patriarch. He was Abu Bakr. He stood among the people, tears running through his face and said, Listen to me, O people. Those of you who worship Muhammad know that he is dead. But those of you who worship Allah know that he is alive and would live forever. A hushed silence fell on the gathering. They were stunned with a shock. Abu Bakr wiped the tears from his eyes and turning to the people, reciting the following verses from the Holy Quran. Muhammad is but a messenger. Messengers of Allah have passed away before him. What if he dies or is slain? Will you turn back upon your heels? And whosoever turns back upon his heels will by no means do harm to Allah, and Allah will reward the thankful. It appeared as though the people did not know that this verse of the Holy Quran had come down until Abu Bakr had recited it that day. Umar said, By Allah, when I heard Abu Bakr recite these words, I was dumbfounded so that my legs would not bear me, and I fell to the ground knowing that the Holy Prophet was indeed dead. When the Prophet died, a potential power struggle was avoided when Umar an supported the candidacy of Abu Bakr. However, Abu Bakr lived only two years more and as he lay dying he appointed Umar an as the next caliph. A council of companions confirmed the appointment and Umar an began his remarkable reign. Umar expanded the area of Arab conquest. Under Umar, the Arab armies took Syria, Palestine, Egypt and entered Iraq and Iran. In all countries, 
the Arab armies were successful in creating one of the largest empires of the time. A key battle was the Battle of Qadisiyah, 637, which led to Arab armies defeating the Sassanid Empire of Persia and opening Iraq to the Muslim Arab armies. Umar was successful in cementing the long-term success of the empire. Arab armies were given strict instruction to allow the native population to continue with their peaceful occupations. So long as they paid tribute to the empire, they were not forced to convert to the new religion and the armies lived at a distance from the towns they conquered. Under Umar, the military was organized professionally and sought to avoid corruption by allowing official complaints to be made against transgressors. Soldiers were paid and defensive cantonments were established at Medina, Kufa, Basra, Mosul, Fustat, that is Cairo, Damascus, Edessa, and Jordan. Finance, accounting, taxation, and treasury departments were organized with full accountability. Police, prisons, and postal units were established. The land was surveyed, and agriculture was encouraged. Old canals were excavated, and new ones built. Large areas of land were brought under cultivation. Roads were laid out and were regularly patrolled. A traveler could move with safety all the way from Egypt to Khorasan in Central Asia. The vast territories of West Asia and North Africa were welded into a free trade zone. Trade fostered prosperity. Education was encouraged and teachers paid. The study of Quran, Hadith, language, literature, writing, and calligraphy received patronage. Over 4,000 mosques were built during the Caliphate of Umar Technology such as the construction of windmills was encouraged. Old bridges and roads were repaired and new ones built. A population census was taken after the example of the Chinese and the Tang dynasty. And it was Umar who started the Islamic calendar based on the Hijra of the Prophet. They devotedly followed the Muslim religion and as a ruler was concerned with the well-being of the poor and disadvantaged. He used to patrol the streets of Medina at night. In this way, he helped himself up to date with what was happening in the Muslim society and to help guard those he was responsible for, that is, the Muslim citizens. It is narrated from Aslam that Umar went to a place located three miles outside Medina, a place where there were black volcanic rocks. There we saw a fire burning. He radiallahu an said, O Aslam, I see here some travelers who are being held up by the night and the cold. Let's go. So we went running, and when we came near them, we saw a woman with children. There was a pot set up over fire, and her children were crying. Umar radiallahu an said, Peace be upon you, O people of the light. He did not want to say, O people of the fire. She said, And upon you be peace. He said, May I come closer? She said, Come if you can do some good. Otherwise, leave us alone. He came closer and said, What is the matter with you? She said, The night and the cold has held us up. He said, What is the matter with these children? Why are they crying? She said, They are hungry. He said, what is in this pot? She said water to calm them down until they go to sleep and Allah will judge between us and Umar. He said, may Allah have mercy on you. How could Umar know about you? She said, how come? He is in charge of our affairs, but he is not aware of our situation. He turned to me, Aslam, and said, let's go. So we set off running until we came to a room where wheat was stored. He took out a sack of wheat and little fat and said, 
hoist it up onto me. I said, I will carry it for you. He said, will you carry my burden for me on the day of resurrection? So I hoisted up onto him and he set out running and I ran with him. When he reached her, he put those things down. He took out some of the wheat and said to her, prepare it for me and I will cook it for you. He started blowing beneath the pot and I saw the smoke coming out through his beard. He cooked it for her and brought it to her and said, bring me something. So she brought him a vessel and he poured it into it. Then he said, feed them and I will spread it out to cool down for them. He stayed until they had eaten their fill and they left the leftover food with her. He got up and I got up with him and she started to say, may Allah reward you with good. You are more suited to be the Caliph than Amir al-Mu'minin Umar, leader of the Muslims. He said, say something good. And if you go to the Amir al-Mu'minin, you will find me there inshallah willing. Then he walked some distance away from her, then turned to face them again and waited a while. I said to him, is there anything else? But he did not answer me until I saw the boys wrestling, playing with each other and then falling asleep. Then he stood up and said, Praise be to Allah, the Exalted, the Almighty. Then he turned to me and said, O oh, Aslam, hunger kept them awake and made them cry. I did not want to leave until I saw them smiling. Ibn Kathir said, When Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, finished performing Hajj pilgrimage in the year 23 Hijri, and the mothers of the believers were with him, he supplicated to Allah, glorified and exalted, and complained to him that he has become old. He also supplicated him that he has become weak and the subjects have increased and that he was afraid of being negligent. He asked Allah to take him and bestow martyrdom upon him in the city of the Prophet in Medina. It happened that Abu Lu'lu al-Fayruz, the fire worshipper and non-believer and had a Roman origin, stabbed Umar an while he was in the Fajr Salah with a dagger of two blades. He stabbed him three times, one of these below the navel. Hence, Umar an fell down bleeding. Umar was carried to his home, bleeding from his wound. He started to wake up and then faint. When death became near, he fainted and his head was on the ground. His son, Abdullah, put his head in his lap. When he woke up, he said to his son, put my head on the ground, which he did. Umar wiped his face with dust and said, woe to Umar, woe to Umar, woe to Umar's mother, if Allah does not forgive Umar. When he died, Saeed ibn Zaid wept. He was asked, what makes you cry? He answered, I cry over Islam by the death of Umar. Islam has been cut. This cut will not be patched until the day of judgment.